This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. Hey everybody, it's John Hall, the senior editor of Craft Beer and Brewing, and I'm really, really, really excited today um, because I have uh, Justin Miller from Hopworks Urban Brewery in Portland, Oregon. Morning, John. Across me. Good morning. Thanks for doing this. Yeah, no problem. I'm really happy to be here. Um, your brewery does so many different things, focusing on uh, environmental aspects, but also uh, really, I think, embodying so much of what makes Portland, Oregon beer so world renowned and world respected you know uh, so much uh, every time i visited uh, your brewery uh, I, i've been sort of struck that this is sort of portland personified in, in a lot of ways and and i'm curious as to what inspires you these days when you're brewing yeah absolutely um so first off we're super lucky to be in portland because we do have incredibly receptive customer base to uh to our sustainability and to our environmentally friendly practices, um, people are, are very, uh, um, they, they love to talk about that. They love to see it. Um, but, but what inspires me, I, I'm typically looking at beer through the lens of food. So my, my life kind of came into, uh, the beer world through food. Um, so anytime I'm thinking about, about beer, I'm thinking about food, whether or not it it's how it pairs with food or, um, or, you know, using food type ingredients or being inspired by cocktails, things like that. So that's what inspires me right now. Um, where are we with the intersection of beer and food right now when it comes to pairing? Cause it seems like years ago, you know, uh, beer dinners were all the rage and people were trying to find ways of doing that. And now it, it almost seems like that's been lost a little bit, at least in my perspective of, I don't hear nearly as many you know, beer dinners popping up or, uh, has it just become so much part of our food culture now anyway, like with having beer at restaurants and having beer around that we don't necessarily need to think of it this way or with all these breweries that are out there these days, do you think we've just sort of, there's so much noise, it's hard to focus on specific things. I think it's both. I think you're absolutely right. There's a lot less beer dinners out there in the world, but, um, beer has almost become food kind of a thing. You'll see like milkshake IPAs, right? And like biscotti uh, stouts. Yeah, and, horchata stouts and yeah, all these, yeah. Yeah, so there's a ton of food inspiration out there in the beer world and I think people are responding well to that. Um, but I do think the concept of, of um, kind of the beer and food pairings and things like that has become a little more antiquated and uh, they're kind of putting food in the beer. <laughs> right, and it's... and it, and it I've talked with other brewers about this where actually putting food into beer does not necessarily make a, a food beer. You know, I, yeah, it, it is in like the, the, the black, black and whitest sense. But it was always kind of fun in some of the earlier days when brewers were trying to mimic specific dishes or specific flavors, but using the four main ingredients of beer or finding uh, specific things that go into a dish um, that give sort of this essence of it as opposed to, hey, we're going to take a chicken parm from the local uh, <laughs> Italian place, we're going to puree it, and we're going to dump it into a pale ale. Right. You know, like it used to be like, well, maybe we'll put like a little basil in and maybe we'll use a little breadcrumb or we'll use a little, like there's something like that. It, it, it just seemed like it was a little bit more, I don't know, these days it, it, it's a little gimmicky, it seems. Yeah, sometimes it can be. Um, there's a lot that can be done with, with hops alone. You know, you have hops that taste like dill. You have hops that taste like fruit. You know, you have malts that are that taste like raisins. Um, so there's a lot that can be done with the main ingredients. Personally, for me, I think the world's wide open, and I would put anything into a beer as long as it made a great beer. As long as it made a great beer. When you're thinking of pairings and you're thinking of uh, beer and food, where do you start? Um... I typically just start with, um, God, that's a great question. Good, good question. <laughs> um, I would, I would say that I start kind of based off of, of recent experiences, um, and, and what's hot and what customers are, are talking about and what people are currently interested in. Okay. But then how do you find what do you look for when you're matching like what's in the glass with what's on the plate? You know, are you trying to find five touch points, one touch point, a hundred? Like where, where does it fall for you? I'm typically trying to find complementary flavors. Like, um, you know, you're looking for an acid and you're looking for 
um, maybe a salt or you're looking for um, an, an herb or a spice type of a thing. So I'm looking for I'm looking for you know two to three complementary flavors. I'm not trying to make something that tastes exactly like you know that specific food, but I want it to remind you of that and kind of give you um, it could it could complement that particular thing. Is there something in your mind that really sticks out above all the other pairings that you've done in the past that uh, you want everybody to know about that everybody should go and try and experience at some point? Um, let's see. I did um, a kombucha-inspired beer recently. Okay. It was a, uh, that wasn't just kombucha? No, it wasn't, okay. it wasn't kombucha <laughs> at all. Um, so we, we pair often with like-minded companies, and Brew Doctor Kombucha came in um, and... Great, great folks. We really, really like collaborating with them. They're a lot of fun to collaborate with. Um, but we started talking. We went into their tea house, and we we pulled out some teas off the walls, and and we were like, okay, what what beer are we making together? Um, we call this series our our win win collaboration series. Okay. So it's like you know two B corporations put together, or um, two sustainable or two organic corporations put together. So we were trying to figure out what we were going to do for our win-win, and I brought them a bunch of samples of different styles, and we blended some teas with some different styles, um, and we ended up brewing a, um, a sour beer that we, we blended rose petals, and we blended black tea, and we blended green tea um, hmm. into, and um, so you had kind of that sour lactic flavor in addition to those tea flavors and the herbs and the, um, the aromatics from, that would be in a typical kombucha and it was a really interesting, really interesting project. And then what do you put that with food-wise? Um, you know, that was, a, that was a summertime kind of a project. So th- that was going with, like, like melons. And um, you have that, like, nice refreshing tea mm-hmm. and the tartness kind of thing with the sweetness of a, of a melon. Um, or, 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 like, a salad um, also with that. I want to switch gears because you brought up that uh, Hopworks uh, is a B Corp. And I could try to stumble my way through uh, the elevator pitch of, of, of what that is, but it's probably better to hear from you as to uh, what a B Corp is uh, and why it's important that Hub is that, uh, you know, follows that model. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've adapted and grown quite a bit as we've, as we've grown up as a brewery. And um, we joined B Corp to sort of tie all of our ideas together so we had been we had been organic for a very long time we had been carbon neutral for a very long time and we had sort of all of these sustainable ethos ideas and b corp really helped us wrap our head around um the focus of all of that so what b corp is to us is the simple mission of people planet and profit so b corp helps us uh focus first on on uh the people um, and that's not just our employees, but also every, every, everybody we interact with on a daily basis, whether it be, you know, someone who delivers food to us, um, someone in our neighborhood, one of our customers, um, things like that. And then planet, obviously we've already had the huge planet focus, um, throughout our 10 years of, of brewing beer. Um, and then lastly is the profit portion and that's just the, that's just running a business. So, yeah. Um, so how do you put that into practice? Um, so we, have done quite a few things. Um, we've worked very, very hard recently on um, employee health initiatives to uh, to to keep our employees healthy and happy. So um, we've put a lot of uh, uh, exercise initiatives out there. We have uh, offered quite a quite a bit of uh, discounts on gym memberships. We um, we've implemented a lot of new sustainable brewing practices. Um, a uh, really great example would be we, we installed a CIP skid into the building, which allows us to uh, reclaim all of our detergent mm-hmm. when we wash all of our tanks. Um, so every single CIP, we can then, w- when we're cleaning our tanks, we can recollect our detergent into our, our skid, heat it back up, um, and we can tell, we can just uh, take a reading of how strong it is, and then if it's if it's still at the right level, we can use it again on the next tank and again on the next tank. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that saves a ton of water. It saves a ton of, of chemical. Um, we don't have to run any of that down the drain. We can just filter it, reuse it, and, and until it's uh, no longer usable. So that's that's a really nice water savings for us. Um, we're working on 
wastewater treatment currently. We're on a, we're working on a big wastewater treatment project um, so that we can lower our impact on um, on the city of Portland. As we uh, as we grow as a brewery, we want to lower our impact on on the wastewater treatment in the city of Portland. Um, and so we we do a lot of a lot of um, stuff like that. So. I, I'm always curious about the environmental impacts of brewing because I, there, there, there really is a lot of ways that uh, local waterways, local environments can actually be, be harmed through the brewing process. We all think of beer as, as, as a lot of fun, but I, I increasingly more and more and more I'm talking to brewers you know, like you who are saying – uh, you're, you're focusing on the after the brewing process now, yeah. um, which I don't think that that was really even being discussed five years ago uh, in, in that way. And what do you think has sort of led to this this change? You know, I know people have been thinking about it, but like not necessarily acting on it. So what do you think has happened in the last couple of years that has led brewers to really start following through on, on, on good practices? Absolutely. Um, well, there's been a lot of good good leaders out there in the world. Um, the New Belgiums and uh, Sierra Nevadas of yeah. the world have definitely um, pushed a lot of those breweries towards that. They've led a really great example, mm-hmm. um, and um, and they've they've really kind of paved the way for a lot of these breweries. And um, I think that's inspired a lot of people to to make some changes. One of the things, uh, and I wrote about this on beerandbrewing.com, for your 10th anniversary, uh, you had a Salmon Safe Ingredient IPA Festival, which is uh, in, in New Jersey, where I live, uh, we don't necessarily have a lot of salmon running, so it's not something that I'm often uh, thinking about. Uh, but when I was talking to Eric Steen at your, uh, at your brewery uh, about it, he was you know, really uh, keen on what was going on and um, uh, filling me in and, and really just sort of excited um, that you guys were, were doing this type of thing. Um, First of all, what is Salmon Safe, and you know how can a brewery actually you know help this great fish species? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Salmon Safe is not just for people who live in regions where salmon are prolific. Um, salmon Safe is kind of for everybody. The reason it's called Salmon Safe is because salmon are an indicator species of environmental health. So um, it it. It doesn't matter if you don't have salmon in your area. Um, it's all about the, the waterways. Mm-hmm. So we are a, um, a certified salmon safe campus at our facility, um, one of the first in the Pacific Northwest. And we basically um, we work with a lot of farmers that produce salmon safe ingredients. And and what salmon safe is is it is uh, salmon safe is like the water version of organic. So mm-hmm. if, if organic is the tilth and organic is the soil. Um, salmon safe would be the water. So a lot of these farmers we work with are, are dedicated to protecting the watershed. So they do a lot of things where they, they build, um, let's say barriers along the, their rivers and creeks that go along their farm. Mm -hmm. They do a lot of things like, um, they, they count pest to predator ratios on their farms. Instead of using pesticides, sometimes they'll think about, okay, um, how many spiders? Uh, no, it sounds crazy. It's like how many spiders do we have? How many, how many wasps do we it's have? The worst internship ever. <laughs> so they they think really deeply hey, about. Billy, what'd you do this summer? Well, I was hanging out in a hop farm counting the spiders. Uh, <laughs> God. Uh, all right, sorry. Yeah. That's all good. Yeah. So they 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 use things like that um, to say, you know, is this pest problem going to go away naturally? And, um, and what can we do to encourage more predators? Can we build rows of secondary crops that aren't hops that maybe aren't money makers, but can help us produce a larger, stronger hop crop based on, um, a healthier environment around it. Um, so they do a ton of things that, that help the, the watersheds around them. Um, so we wanted to bring together a bunch of different breweries, that would uh, commit to, to using salmon safe ingredients to try to inspire some more people to get excited about salmon safe ingredients. Um, and we had a bunch of breweries come out. Some of our favorite breweries came down and did salmon safe beers, and they were all really great. Um, and it's not just hop firms, right? There's also a, a, a malt house that's also a maltster that, that is certified as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I think a lot of people ended up working with Mainstem malt for that. Mm-hmm. And um, Mainstem is a toll, toll malter. Um, or they, they work with toll malting. So what they do is they, they go to farms and they say, Hey, you know, here's this idea. Can we plant this barley on your farm? 
um, using salmon safe practices. Um, and these are all of the added benefits to your farm um, through salmon safe practices and through growing barley on your farm as a secondary crop that, that may help um, bring different species to the farm. Have you found, I guess it can go both ways, right? Where there's, you know, some folks who will support a brewery because, you know, they believe in like-minded causes, but then there's going to be some other folks who say, you know, like, don't put your politics into my beer. Don't put your, you know, your, your environmental thoughts into my beer. I just, I just want to drink beer. Um, have you, have you encountered much of that? It's, I mean, it sounds like you guys are pretty thoughtful in the way that you want to go forward. And if anybody gives you criticism, you're not going to, uh, spend too much time arguing with them. But um, I guess the, the, the roundabout question is, um, where's the responsibility lie uh, for a brewer to be an educator beyond beer? Uh, that's a good question. So um, I'm like five for five right now with good questions. So thank you. <laughs> those of you keeping tabs at home. That's my way of saying like, hey, can I just have a couple seconds yeah, exactly. to think? <laughs> no, I know. I know it's exactly what it is. But yeah, it's uh, but I'm going to pretend like I, you know, yeah, I'm good at what I do. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we, we aren't offended if people are just at our brewery to drink beer. Um, we make great beer and, and that's okay. Um, I think that, um, we definitely have championed a, a cause and, uh, I don't think it's every brewer's responsibility to educate the customer. Um, but I would love it if they did. Mm -hmm. I would, I would, I would love it if everybody was, you know, it's kind of a, that, that rising tide, uh, raises all ships kind of a thing. If everybody was, was on the same page, we would just get better and better and better and better. Sierra Nevada and, and New Belgium have obviously proven that you can be very, very large and still be, you know, very, very committed. But, you know, I, I've often heard from smaller brewers as well, if like it's harder to be as environmentally conscious on a smaller scale than, you know, than even some of the, these larger guys. Is, is that been your experience as well? 100%. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of capital investment that goes into being a sustainable brewery. And, um, you know, we take a lot less, less margin on all of our products, um, in the name of sustainability in the name of environmentally friendly practices. Um, it is very difficult. It is, it's, um, you know, building a water treatment facility is expensive. Uh, being carbon neutral costs money. Um, buying organic ingredients costs money. Um, and you can't actually put that onto the customer too much because, no. you know, yeah, I, if you $20 look, six pack isn't going to, yeah. It's not going to work. Yeah. yeah. And if you look at our products, they're, they're line priced with um, pretty much every other similar sized uh, brewery and similar product on the grocery store shelf. So we don't, we don't really pass much of that onto the customer. Um, we take a lot of it on ourselves, but um, I think it's kind of that doing the right thing when, when nobody's looking idea. Yeah. Um, I want to change gears just a, a little bit again because this uh, autumn is uh, my favorite time for drinking beer because not only do Oktoberfest lagers come out, uh, but we're getting a lot of the fresh hop and a lot of the wet hop beers. And if we're lucky enough uh, to get the beers that are coming out of your region of the country, uh, it's usually among some of the finest. And you brought two beers with you today, uh, and <laughs> I had to chuckle at first. So there's a can of your fresh hop, totally chill hazy IPA. And so we now have New England style hazy fresh hop IPA that exists. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> I'm going to open this as you, yeah. But tell me about like, you know, like, when did you start planning this one out? Um, so this one's about eight months in planning. Um, we've been brewing regular totally chill, which is our hazy IPA. Um, since early spring okay, and we've run it through the summer and we got really excited about the idea of taking this, this incredibly hoppy beer and, um, and hoppy means hoppy. Hoppy doesn't mean bitter anymore. Um, <laughs> taking this incredibly hoppy beer and taking some of those really cool ingredients from our farmers. Um, I'm 45 minutes from my closest hop farm. Um, I feel, I feel spoiled to be brewing in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Um, so it's, 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 uh, envy inducing, I'm sure for a lot of brewers who are listening. Yeah. <laughs> so eight months out, uh, you start planning. How do you, how do you schedule and how do you plan your fresh hop, your wet hop beers? Um, uh, 
because you know it, it really is when the farm tells you that it's ready and then you have you know the clock starts ticking kind of thing but you guys make a lot of different beers i'm sure you guys have production schedules when august september rolls around uh do you guys just have blank spaces in your calendar knowing that you might get a call one afternoon and well hell you're pulling an all-nighter or is it a little bit more dialed in than that it's a combination of the two so uh, it's it's happened because of patience this year, patience on our hot farmers and patience on my cellar manager and a lot of my uh, and a lot of the people that that work with me. Um, the hot farmers have been patient when I'm constantly checking in with them, like, "Hey, is that comment still coming in on time? Are we still good for Monday?" Kind of a thing. So there's been a lot of that checking in with the hot farmers to make sure that uh, I'm sure they love the the constant calls because it's not just you but it's every other brewery within yeah it's everybody and a lot of the farms did a great job this year of um, of being on schedule you know and I think brewers understand too that that it's it's a live thing and it, it's got to be ready when it's ready um, so there's there's been a lot of patience on their part there's been a lot of patience on you know the seller folks at, at, at work where it's like okay uh, schedules change and hops are ready. Here we go. Um, kind of a thing. So we've, we've just had the recipes ready, but just waiting for those hops and, and we'll drop, we'll drop those beers into the schedule for the day they're supposed to harvest. And if it doesn't harvest, we'll just brew tomorrow's beer today and, and brew today's beer tomorrow if, if that's how it goes. So. So this this might be my naivety, uh, not being around uh, during the harvest or, or having access to these beers in the same way that uh, uh, so many folks up in the Pacific Northwest do. But I always just sort of th- thought of some of these as being, you know, normal IPA recipes or pale ale recipes that were just getting doses of fresh and wet hops. And I think that was sort of the case uh, for, for a lot of years. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but... And it's, but it, now it sort of seems like in the same way that there's a an IPA arms race for every style that it sort of leaked into fresh and wet hops, and and the fact that you have two different beers that are not what I would consider classic or standard, I think sort of speaks to that. Yeah, absolutely. We actually have four fresh hop beers this year. This is the biggest fresh hop season we've ever done. Uh, we've produced 380 barrels of fresh hot beer alone already this season, and the uh, season's not quite over. Okay. So, um, what are the other two? Um, so, we have the Cascadian Dark uh, that's over here, and I want to ask you about Black IPA in a minute, but. Um, yeah, so we've got, we've got the one we're drinking now, the Totally Chill Fresh Hop Hazy, which is um, a hazy IPA, nice orange color, um, kind of built around the, the El Dorado hop. Um, the other really cool thing about this particular beer is it's going to be an expression of the fresh hop season because it runs all fresh hop season. Um, customers are going to get a chance to kind of um, taste the beer as it changes because it, it might be Centennial one time and then it's going to be Comet the next time and then it might be El Dorado the time after that. Um, and we don't, we don't call it out. We just let it change and be an expression of the season uh, as it goes through. Um. Yeah, so I'm just I'm looking at the can right now. There's no hop in here, or there's no uh, nothing on the can, uh, but also not on the bottom as well. So that's uh, it's sort of you have to go to the brewery to pick this up to figure it out. Or um, I mean, people, customers are welcome to call and ask, but we're okay. we're basically just at the point where it's like um, it's just an expression of the season. It's ever changing, um, and it's it's constantly a different hop, um, and because. The fresh hop window is so narrow. We're okay with that. It's only a month long. Yeah. So it's not this product that we have to keep. Um, you know, the the beer is going to be consistently um, the same flavor. We're trying to flavor match, um, but it's not this product that we have to keep like the exact same because it only runs for four weeks. So I, I imagine though that there's there's folks who are listening and, and serious hop heads who are going to be maddened by that 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 you're not <laughs> telling them what's in there or uh, that they might not know um, you know what's in there and. I, I kind of like that. It's sort of a, you know, Jesus take the wheel kind of leap of faith uh, when, it, when it comes to, to some of these things. I, I, from your brewer perspective, are we too focused sometimes on specific hop varietals that, you know, we get excited when we hear Citra Mosaic or, you know, and maybe less so when we hear, you know, Chinook Cascade, um, you know, whatever. Is, is this sort of a, an exercise in teaching people to just kind of relax a little bit? Maybe a little bit. Um, I mean, I, I don't know if you're running lab experiments, but it, you know, it, it sounds like this could be. Sometimes um, I, this is not a social experiment by any means, but 
Uh, sometimes we do get a little too focused on the hops, you know, because a brewer um, can use a, a mixture of hops to, to, to mimic a citra flavor, right? You know, uh, I think brewers have proven that there was definitely a shortage of citra throughout the, throughout some of these seasons. And a lot of brewers are getting really creative and they're figuring out ways, you know, I can blend these two hops and it tastes exactly like the beer used to when we had citra in it. Um, so the right blend of hops, um, you know, you're just trying to flavor match, right? So it doesn't matter what the hop is as long as you're getting the flavor you're looking for. Yeah. Um, what excites you about uh, fresh hop season aside from just uh, um, trying out new and different recipes? Or just the, the availability of the ingredients. Yeah. Um, so I've visited, I've been to the hop farm nine times this year. Um, it's been my... Do you work with just one hop farm? No. Okay. Um, we, we This year, for fresh hops, we've worked with uh, Goshi Farms, mm-hmm. and we've worked with Crosby Hop okay. Farms. Um, but uh, I've been nine times, and um, I've become good friends with my hop farmers, and th- that's really exciting to me, the opportunity to go and talk to a fourth-generation hop farmer um, who's still running their family's farm, um, and they're doing things that we are proud of, and they're doing things that we admire, and getting to sit down and talk to that person who, um, you know, Gail Goshi, as an example, is a hero. Oh, hands down, yeah. Um, she's incredibly inspiring. So yeah, if, if people don't know uh, who Gail is and what she's done, uh, go consult your internet search device right now and read up on her because she's a, a hero in the hop industry. Um, so yeah, that, that's that's the answer is is getting to make that personal connection. Um, sometimes you're so far removed from from what you're consuming when you purchase it, um, and I feel like we have a really uh, close connection to um, our farmers and to our ingredients, and that's that's the really exciting thing for me. So when you visit, so let's say you visit the hop farm in the beginning of the season, and then nine times through harvest, what are you looking for? Like, what sort of conversations are you having? Because uh, this is brewer education as well. Like, this is like, by the time you make a beer at the end of the season, uh, you're intimately involved with the ingredient that's going in, with the hops that are going in. But what are you looking for? from start to finish, you know, like what's, what's that evolution process of each time you go there, what you're looking to learn, what you're looking to take away. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, when I go to the farm, I'm looking to, um, to learn about the process of, of how hops, um, make their way to us. I'm looking to, I want to, I want to rip open cones as soon as I get there and start smelling hops. Um, and I want to, and I, and I, it's nice that a lot of these farmers are willing to let me go and, and smell hops while they're fresh because usually the same day that they're pulling fresh hops off of the, the vines, they're also drying in the, in the kiln next door. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can walk over and smell them after they've dried and see kind of what the difference is between the dry version and the wet version. Um, so I'm usually just, uh, out there kind of checking out hops and, and, um, and also just the process of, of producing and harvesting hops. What are you still trying to learn as a brewer? You've been doing this eight years now. You've you know, been fortunate to you know, be in a place where you're surrounded by uh, not only a talented staff, but also you know, talented brewers uh, who are, I'm sure, you know, colleagues and friends in competition at the same time. Um, you know, how do you continue to educate yourself? You know, what, do you, what, what, what still motivates you to, to, to push forward? Um, yeah, I think that, um, I spend a lot of time with other head brewers. <laughs> I hang out with a lot of them. I talk to them about the beers they're making. Um, I talk to them, I ask them kind of, the, kind of these kind of questions as well. Like what, what's exciting them? Um, and, um, I also visit a lot of breweries. Um, part of being a head brewer means drinking a lot of beer. So I try to go to other breweries and, and get inspired, um, and see what other people are doing. Um, I also visit a lot of, um, you know, I attend all the Master Brewers Association of the Americas to keep my education going. But there's so many new things that are coming out in education all the time these days, right? And so, I mean, like, how do you keep up? And I guess, you know, we have a, a lot of folks who are home brewers as well. Um, you know, wh- where should they be looking to further their education as well? Um, the Brewers Association has power hours. Um, I think they do them bi-weekly or weekly. Yeah. Um, which are really, really nice ways to, to keep yourself abreast of what's going on in the beer world. Um, 
I always encourage uh, home brewers to um, to 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 think about potentially attending some sort of a technical school. Um, I think a lot of those um, technical sc- schools are really great. I know I learned a lot through from the American Brewers Guild. Um, in addition to you know, there's Zimmergy, which is I'm sh- I hope they're all reading out there. Yeah, well, <laughs> and obviously Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, but um, absolutely uh, beerandbrewing dot com. Please subscribe. Um, all right, so we poured this beer. Uh, this is your, as you guys are in the Pacific Northwest, your Cascadian Dark Ale, your your fresh hop, uh, Cascadian Dark Ale. Um, what's the difference between Cascadian Dark and Black IPA? Uh, regional. <laughs> it's the difference between a hazy and a New England kind of a thing. Um, so, yeah, yeah, that's just regional. Uh, yeah, I, it's it's sort of an interchangeable uh, uh, style name, I guess. Um, this was one of those styles, and I remember years ago when, when, when the style first hit and everybody was trying to find what's going to be the next new IPA extension. And we had White IPA and we had Black IPA or Cascadian Dark or American Dark Ale, as I, I think the Alstrom Brothers call it over on Beer Advocate. Uh, and then, you know, obviously there's, there's all sorts of other things that happened. And then Hazy happened. And that sort of became the way that everybody moved. That The whole conversation shifted and the whole focus shifted to that. And Black IPA, which I think, and or Cascadian Dark, had so many great merits to it, and was this this melding of so many fun different flavors. But for the most part, it seems like it just kind of died on the national scene, and you're hard pressed to really find one these days. And you guys made one for your tenth anniversary beer. <laughs> so, one, what's the appeal? And two, what goes into making a good Cascadian Dark? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do think this beer has lost a lot of uh, the traction around the world, um, which I think it's a great style. I think it's a delicious beer. Um, and I think that these these beers range so greatly um, from bitter and roasty and ashy to uh, caramely and, and raisiny. Um, I think so the, the draw for the 10th anniversary beer is uh, this is not your typical Cascadian Dark Ale. This is this is an Imperial Cascadian Dark Ale. Um, What's the ABV on this? Oh, let me look real quick. Sorry, it's been a while. <laughs> you just made it last week. I didn't make it last week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's eight nine. So okay. Yeah. Great. We're recording at nine thirty in the morning. Uh, <laughs> Drinking eight point nine percent alcohol beer. Just another day at my office. Um, okay, but yeah. Yeah, so what makes it special? It's not a it's not a typical CDA. Um, it's imperial. It's fresh hop. Um, these are the very first hops off of Goshi's farm this year. They weren't even harvesting yet. They did a special harvest um, specifically for for this beer. So these are the centennials that they that they had in one particular field that were um, very ripe, very early, and um, and. T- to me, what makes a, a CDA so so great, what I think should go into a CDA is um, this should be an attempt at making a dark beer, uh, but an attempt at making a dark beer with as little of that ashy, kind of acrid, roasty flavor as possible. So, you know, um, Cinemar is, is a great um, tool at your disposal mm-hmm. for making dark beers. Carafa is a great tool. Um I'm not the biggest fan of midnight wheat, but a lot of people use midnight wheat for making making dark beers like this. Um, so for me, it's about the balance of you do have some of those dark malt flavors. You you have to have that there, but not letting it go into the the ashy, roasty malt bitterness, um, and to really let the hops be the uh, the star of the show. Because it really struck me that a lot of the early incarnations of this had that ashy thing going for it. And you, you, you keep saying dark beer and you're, you're not actually prescribing a specific style, but there's so many people I think who were making this style early on, uh, no matter what they were calling it. And they were going for a robust porter that was aggressively hopped, or they were going for a dry Irish stout that was aggressively hopped and it had merits, but it didn't always have the follow through at the end. I think everybody was kind of left with that you know, uh, bad taste in your mouth a little bit uh, from that, uh, from that ashy, from that roast. Um, you know, too much. And I think some of that is what pushed people away from this style, is because it was like it was like a stout or a porter that had hops in it, and that was like, whoa, what is this? Yeah. 
And, you know, and simply adding the three letters of IPA to it, you know, it's like, oh, it'll guarantee to sell. But, you know, it just it didn't hit in the way that I think, uh, you know, people wanted to. But uh, I, I really enjoy this particular beer just because, like, it doesn't have that ashy, roasty. Um, and, and the hops, like, you get the uh, that sort of fun herbal punch from the fresh hops uh, that, that are in here. But it's also not overpowering. Like, you can still taste the base beer as well. So this uh, one was done slightly different than the one we just had. Okay. Um, so the Totally Chill Fresh Hop, um, those those fresh hops are added in the Whirlpool, so they're actually heated. This particular version, we do, um, like, a hop soak, so we don't ever heat the hops with this one. Really? Yeah. What's the benefit of that? Um, the, the flavors are quite different. You really kind of mute out that fresh hop flavor if you, um, if you let it get hot for too long, which is why I like the totally chill. We do a lot of it in the hot back. Mm -hmm. Um, we split about half into the hot back and half into the whirlpool when we do that. Um, but the more you heat that, the more you, you know, a lot of those, those flavors and aromas are very volatile. So that heat's going to take a lot of that away. Um, when you do this kind of wet soak, you really just get that fresh hop flavor. So you, you gotta like fresh hop beers to do that kind of a thing. So, um, as we start to wrap up, I've been asking a lot of folks, uh, who've, who've come on the show and I'm hosting, what's your hope for beer? Oh, my hope for beer. It's like, what's my hope for my kid, right? <laughs> <laughs> Don't be a jerk. That's, you know, that's my whole thing for, for my kid these days is just, you know, grow up and still be kind and smart and curious. But, uh, yeah. I'm helping you stall right now as you, uh, as you think in the back of your brain to, to answer my question, uh, even though you didn't say it was a great question. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll live, I'll live with that disappointment somehow. Um, no, but I, it's sort of this open-ended question that I've been asking folks because I, I think it means different things for, 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 for different folks, and it's sort of this fun Rorschach test. I don't know if anybody actually listens to, by the end of this podcast that they know that this is what I do, but um, you know, hopefully people find the question interesting. Uh, I likened it to asking what, what it's like, uh, to, to what I want for my kid kind of thing because it's so important to me because um, it is like that for, for me. Um, my hope, my hope for beer is, is that um, is that the the industry continues to grow. Um, I would I would love for for more and more people to to learn about the love of beer. I would love for uh, for more people to you know educate about the responsibility of, of being a brewer and that that responsibility to the environment. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I would love I I really a lot of brewers don't like the trend that the beer industry is on right now. Which one? Just sort of like um, this move as far away from the Rhine Heights Gabbat as possible and uh, anything goes. I really actually like that. And I love the open mindedness of the beer industry. And I love it almost brings more people into the the beer industry. It's It's a more inclusive environment. It's not just like very like this has to be this exact way all the time. It's got to taste this way. Um, it's like, no, an IPA can taste different than, than you think. And I'd love to surprise you with something like that kind of yeah. thing. Um, so I hope that people continue to keep an open mind about what beer is. I like it. Justin Miller, the head brewer at Hopworks Urban Brewery in Portland, Oregon. Thanks for sitting down this morning. Thank you so much, John. And if people want to find you, I guess they can go to the, the Google and ask. But uh, do you want to tell people, like, is there a website or... You know, come visit or something like that. Um, yeah, absolutely. Come by the pub. <laughs> say, fit, you're trying to figure out www. Yeah. Say hello and visit, um, or or just go to hopworksbeer.com and, and learn more about what we do. I don't have a personal website or anything like that, um, but please go to hopworksbeer.com and, and and learn more about what we do. And if you want to learn more about what we do at Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, you can go to beerandbrewing.com. If you have questions for me, guests you'd like to hear on the show, topics you'd like discussed, you can reach out directly at John Hall, J-O-H-N-H-O-L-L at beerandbrewing.com or join the conversation on Twitter at John underscore Hall. Thanks again, Justin, for doing this. This was, this was a really fun conversation. Yeah, and, absolutely. And uh, we'll be back next week with a brand new episode. Cheers. Cheers. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.com.